point out there is a printed handout for tonight. I was just a little bit late in getting it out. Um, so if you want a copy of what we're going to look at tonight, it will be out there in the foyer area. Uh, tonight we'd just like to talk about the apostles. Uh, these men represent a very significant part of our faith and of the church or body of Christ, and so we ought to know a little bit about these men and what the scriptures tell us. Uh, some of them we don't really know a whole lot about. I suspect that's because Jesus didn't want us worshiping uh, and idolizing these men, but a few of them did things so incredible and, and uh, did things that are recorded that we do know a lot about a few of these. But again, some of them we don't know a whole lot about uh, other than the fact they were apostles. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the office and work of the apostles at first, and then we're just going to talk about primarily the 12 apostles though really we'll include 13 and 14, uh, so it'll be a baker's dozen, I guess, but um, just a little bit about who these men were and what their work was. The apostles were specifically appointed messengers. They held a definite office. In the Greek, this word comes from apostolos, and it literally means a messenger, an envoy, or a delegate. And so at times, the scriptures will refer to somebody as a messenger. Well, in the Greek, that word is literally apostolos, other places apostle. Uh, Barnabas comes to mind as you might think of him as an apostle, but he is not in the same category as the twelve. So we just need to understand that this word has a, a common use. Much like how uh, diakonos, where we get our word deacon, deacon can refer to a specific office. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 says to the church in Philippi, to the uh, elders and deacons and all the saints, uh, as well as 1 Timothy chapter 3 talks about the qualifications for deacons. So deacon or diakonos in the Greek can refer to a specific office held by certain men in the local congregation, yet uh, in Romans chapter 16, Phoebe is spoken of as a servant of the church diakonos in the Greek, but I don't think that means she held the office of deacon as she was not a, a married man with children and, and a few other reasons too. But um, So apostle can, in its generic sense, just refer to anybody sent as a messenger, but specifically what we're going to focus on tonight is these 12 men primarily with the addition of Paul. We'll talk about where he fits into this later, but we're going to talk about these 12 men who held the office of apostle. Now at its core, that's what it means, a messenger, an envoy, or a delegate. And so these men functioned as witnesses of Christ. A couple of scriptures back this idea up that they functioned as witnesses. Now, when I talk about a witness, it wasn't merely a, a testimony about their personal beliefs. That's not really the biblical concept of, of, of being a witness, that, that I, I give you a testimony of my personal experiences or my personal beliefs, but it's the fact that they were actually witnesses of the resurrected Christ. In Acts chapter 2, we'll start there. Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> this idea of being a witness of Christ comes up time and time again. And we'll notice this as well in Acts chapter 1, a little bit later when they appoint Matthias to replace Judas, they had to find someone who was like the other 11 surviving apostles, a witness of Christ. But here in Acts chapter 2, and notice verse 32, it says, <clears throat> This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. If you notice the context, Peter is speaking along with the other apostles. That's the context there when he says, we are all witnesses to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead by God. And so that's what they, they have reference to. Uh, a little bit later on in chapter 10, when Peter there is uh, teaching Cornelius, uh, the first Gentile convert to Christ, Acts chapter 10 and verse 39 and we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. So they witnessed the life of Jesus. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So not only were they witnesses of, of Jesus, there were a lot of people that met Jesus but they had to be a witness of Jesus after his resurrection. 
And it says, we even ate with him. We even sat down and ate a meal with him. So he wasn't some ghostly apparition or some vision. He was genuinely the resurrected bodily, you know, Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what they were specifically witnesses of. One other verse, 1 John chapter 1. John was one of the apostles, and he's most likely the one who wrote the gospel, as well as the three epistles that bear his name, in addition to the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 1. Now, really what we're dealing with in 1 John is uh, Gnosticism or false teachers and uh, people who are coming in and teaching uh, false things about Christ. And so to set the record straight, notice 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, John, likely the longest surviving apostle, we'll talk about that more later, he says, hold on, let me set the record straight. I was a witness of Christ. I'm not just making things up. He says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld with our hands, handled, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So again, he says, things that we've seen and heard, things that we've actually heard with our own ears, touched with our own hands, seen with our own eyes. We are witnesses to all these things that matter so very much to our faith. So they were witnesses of the resurrection. And regarding their work, its nature was foundational. Uh, we don't really have time to get into it very deeply, but I think the answer is actually quite simple. Do we need apostles today? And the answer is no, when you consider um, the nature of their work. It was to lay a foundation. Ephesians chapter 2, it of course refers to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, that, that Jesus is, I mean, the focal point of our entire faith. But uh, he includes the apostles in there. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. How many foundations does a building need? Just one. These 12 men, these apostles, represent the foundation with Jesus being the very centerpiece of it, the most critical and critically important part of that foundation. But again, their work was foundational. Their work was establishing the book of Acts begins what Jesus started, now the apostles will continue. Jesus began a lot of things. Jesus accomplished salvation, but he left a lot of the, the building. He left a lot of that work uh, of establishing, of founding to the apostles after him. So that is the nature of their work. Uh, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14, very symbolic in nature, but it also speaks of uh, this, this heavenly picture of a new Jerusalem is having 12 foundation stones, each having the name of the 12 apostles, not a continuous succession of apostles. It refers to these 12 we're going to talk about tonight. Um, additionally, one other thing regarding their work, they were promised unique powers and gifts from the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, 16, and 17, they are promised the helper, the Spirit, Jesus said, you don't want me to leave because you know, you, you'll miss me, but uh, trust me, if I go, it's to your advantage because when I go, the spirit or helper comes. He says, you won't have to think about what to say. You won't have to think or recall how to give your testimony. The spirit will help you. And, and in Acts chapter 1, they are told to wait in Jerusalem until they are clothed with power from on high. And in Acts chapter 2, the spirit is poured out from heaven upon these 12 men, and they are doing incredible things, speaking in, in foreign languages, and they have the ability to cast out demons and heal all kinds of sickness. And in Acts chapter 8, there's this uh, sorcerer named Simon. He sees that this power is, you know, the Holy Spirit. Um, they could impart these gifts, but it was only the apostles. Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. This is, a, I think, a very important detail, minor as it may seem, but in Acts chapter 8, uh, it, it says in verse 18, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And they quickly rebuked him for it, but the apostles had the unique ability to impart these gifts. 
And so that's one explanation as to why we don't have those spiritual gifts today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says we don't really need them. We have the word completed, but um, ultimately uh, it was something all the, uh, the apostles could impart. And, you know, after uh, the last apostle died, the ability to pass on spiritual gifts died with them. That's what the scriptures would seem to indicate. So our focus tonight is going to be very simple. We're just going to talk about these men, a few verses for each of them, and um, because it's important to know who these men were that played such a critical role in, in founding the church, the, the, the body of Christ that we're a part of. We're very familiar with Christ and, of course, his essential role in being the sacrifice to forgive us of our sins, but these men are spoken of as the foundation upon which we are built. So we ought to know a little bit about these men and, and be grateful. So for each of these, we can, we can take away some lessons and, and certainly learn a few things that will help us keep, it, uh, keep all these names straight in our minds. And it does get kind of complicated. You've got Simon, who is called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. And so sometimes you compare these lists and you have to kind of do a little bit of guesswork like, well, this is a different name, and this is a different name here. All the other 11 names match up, so these are probably the same person, just different names. So you have to do a little bit of that, but the, we're going to start with kind of the inner circle, so to speak. Um, you know, the couple of disciples that Jesus had with him at the Transfiguration, he seems to have had a closer relationship with a few of them. Perhaps that's why we know more about them, but Simon is where we'll start. We often refer to him as Peter, um, but one thing we want to notice is he was given this name. In John chapter 1, his name is Simon, his given name, but in John chapter 1, this is something I never really even noticed until recently, but Jesus gives him a new name. In uh, John chapter 1 and verse 42, um, his brother brings him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas which translated means Peter or rock, if you will. And so his name, Peter or Cephas, that we often think of, uh, Peter is his primary name, that was given to him by Jesus. That was kind of a title describing his strength and his ability to endure. Um, compared to uh, Judas, Judas betrayed Jesus, and in his grief he committed suicide. Peter denied Jesus three times, yet afterwards strengthened himself and continued with the work. And so we do see a certain resolve with Peter. Even though he was known for being a little bit impetuous and maybe headstrong at times, he certainly uh, rose to the top uh, among the apostles in a number of ways. He was initially a fisherman. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 talks about that as he was fishing alongside his brother Andrew, another one of the apostles. Um, so that, that was his background, and Jesus said, we'll make you a, a fisher of men. And so it kind of played to his strengths. And that was one of those things, being a Galilean fisherman in Acts chapter 2, when they were speaking in tongues, that's what in, impressed people and puzzled people. Aren't these Galileans? You know, the rednecks or hillbillies? How are they speaking so many languages? These aren't, you know, in our modern vernacular, you'd say, these aren't the kind of people that go to college. How do they know all this stuff? But Jesus picked them for a reason. Uh, as I mentioned before, turn to Matthew 14. He was known for being a little bit impetuous. He would kind of, you know, um, run before he could walk, so to speak. But I've always admired Peter's eagerness. Matthew chapter 14. And so there's lessons we can take away from each of these men. And for me, when I think about Peter... I admire his strength and, and durability that even when he made some pretty serious mistakes or lapses in judgment, he, he never got so frustrated to the point where he quit. Um, and, and that's a great quality and I like. Even though maybe he should have been a little more thoughtful, I like the fact that he's eager. He's always the first. In Acts 2, he's the first one to speak up. Acts chapter 1, he's the first to speak up. He's always the first to talk. He's always the first to leap into action. And that can be a good thing. Maybe he just needed to temper it with a little more, a little more thoughtfulness. But I've always admired this about him. Matthew 14 and verse 25. Uh, and in the fourth watch of the night, uh, and my footnote says 3 to 6 a.m., so this is definitely late night. Um, he came to them walking on the sea. So they're out in a boat and middle of the night Jesus is walking across the water and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were frightened saying it is a ghost and they cried out for fear 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He needed a little bit of help. But again, I admire his, his willingness. He's the one that got out of the boat. Uh, in chapter 16, again, we see his kind of uh, his willingness to just make a snap decision. In Matthew 16, Jesus for the first time reveals to them, hey, my life is headed on a direction where I'm, I'm very soon going to Jerusalem to die. And uh, Matthew 16 and verse 21 um, Jesus told him, uh, and so in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And imagine that, someone rebuking Jesus. But he said to him, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And that's where Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Peter, you don't realize you are, you are opposed to my plan or my purpose. My purpose is to come and be a sacrifice. But well, he was willing to speak his mind. Uh, in Matthew 26 and verse 31, you know, Jesus said, someone's going to betray me. And, and, and Peter says, huh, never. I will never do that. Never, ever. Not me. Everyone else will, but not me. He had a little bit of confidence in himself. But Jesus said, well, Peter, as a matter of fact, you will deny me three times before this night is over. And, of course, he did. And that was, I think, a very pivotal moment in his life. In John chapter 18, it's revealed that he is the one. You kind of compare all the gospel accounts where Jesus is being arrested in the garden and um, one of them says that somebody took out a sword and you know but but as John chapter uh, 18 that reveals Peter is the one when Jesus was being arrested Peter is the one that pulled out the sword and cut off the ear of the servant and I don't think he was aiming for that guy's ear I don't think he was that precise trying to nick off his ear I think he was going for his head he was he was prepared to throw down and give his life to defend his his friend Jesus of course, Jesus put a stop to it and put the guy's ear back on and healed it and said, eh, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So he definitely had some lessons to be learned. Now, regarding Peter, we don't know exactly how he died. I'm going to share a little bit with each of these men how, how they died, but take it with a grain of salt. Really, James is the only one I can say for certain, but some of this is, is substantiated by outside sources, other historical writers in the time of the apostles. But a lot of it is just kind of tradition. It's always been said this way. But regarding Peter, it is said that he was crucified in Rome upside down. It's kind of like just, you know, um, one, more, one more level of offense. It's, not, it's, it's embarrassing enough and shameful enough to be hung up on a cross, but we'll, we'll do it upside down just to make it even worse. Um, so that, that's, that's what tradition says about Simon, who is called Peter. Now, his brother Andrew... Um, was a disciple of John the Baptist. This is, this is how they got involved. In John chapter 1, we already read in John chapter 1 and verse 42 when, when Andrew brings Peter to Jesus and Jesus gives him the name Cephas. But let's back up a little bit. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. They uh, came, therefore, and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And so it starts with Andrew being a disciple or a follower of John the Baptist. But I like the story I like from Andrew is that um, he shared. He had an eagerness to share, an excitement to share. Peter, we found the Christ. We found the Messiah. And I think we all should learn that. It's easy to see why he... He fell into place as one of Jesus' disciples and eventually one of his apostles. This man had an eagerness and a willingness to share good news. 
that's that's a great lesson to learn. Um, so that that's the bulk of what we know. He was the brother, and they were both fishermen together with their dad, and they were actually business partners with James and John. Uh, they all had kind of a fishing business together. Uh, but tradition says he was imprisoned in Greece and then crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. You ever heard the expression St. Andrew's cross, where it's more of an X rather than the up and down? So he was uh, traditionally thought of to be crucified in a slightly different fashion, kind of like his brother. Not, not crucified exactly the same way as Jesus, but crucified nonetheless is how most people believe he met his end. Now we get another set of brothers, James and John. Uh, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 9, there's the story where they're supposed to go ahead. Uh, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. And in Luke chapter 9, he sends James and John ahead of him and... Uh, you know, we really get the impression that James had a fiery temperament. Uh, one example of that, Luke chapter 9 and verse 52, um, he sent messengers on ahead of him and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him and they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And he turned to them and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man do not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Boy, if I could have any power the apostle had, calling down fire from heaven, wouldn't that be incredible? But we see a willingness on James and, and, and even John. They, just, they, they took offense and they were offended for Jesus. And they said, we want to call down fire on these people. And, and so they earned the nickname. Mark chapter 3 and verse 17 says of these two, they were called the sons of thunder probably speaks to their fiery temperament, their willingness to, to uh, act uh, you know, in, in, in anger, so to speak. In Acts chapter 12, we know how this apostle died. He is the first of the apostles to be killed or martyred. Now, Judas dies first, but Judas took his own life. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1, Now about that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church, in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And so that's what happens to James. Uh, his brother John called alongside his brother, and uh, they were partners. Luke chapter 5 and verse 10, if you want to write that down. Luke chapter 5 and verse 10, they were partners. So we had um, Peter and Andrew and James and John, along with their father Zebedee and, and and, and such, they were all business partners together in this, uh, their little fishing company, commercial fishermen. So Luke points that out in his text. Uh, and he was called alongside from the boat, and they left their father. That's in Matthew chapter 4. Now, John is the one who, who wrote the Gospel of John. And uh, if you turn to John chapter 20, he points this out. A number of times he... he refers to himself within this book that he writes as the apostle whom Jesus loved, suggesting perhaps a closer relationship uh, than some of the other apostles. Um, but that's how he refers to himself. So in uh, John chapter 20, starting in verse 20, you have kind of this exchange between Peter and Jesus after his resurrection. And, and so in verse 20, <clears throat> Oh, sorry, John chapter 21. John chapter 21 and verse 20. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Uh, Peter, therefore, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. This saying, therefore, went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? I kind of look at that as Jesus saying, Peter, you just do what I told you. Don't worry about what I tell other people to do. If I want him to stay and live forever, and that, that's what I want John to do. Well, that's his business. Peter, you just do what I told you to do. You don't worry about other people. Uh, verse 24, though, this is the disciple who bears witness of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his witness is true. 
So he's identifying himself. So that, that disciple, and when we compare the stories, it's clear that the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and he identifies himself as the one who, who wrote this gospel. Um, <clears throat> he likely also wrote the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and as well as the book of Revelation from the island of Patmos. Now John is regarded to be the only apostle who uh, avoided a violent death. He lived uh, probably past 90 A.D., uh, I can't say precisely when, but it's safe to say 90 A.D. would be a, uh, a good time to suggest he lived there. And, and there are a few people, like uh, Polycarp, who is an early Christian writer, uh, claims to have been a disciple of John the Apostle. And so he lived quite a bit longer than some of the other apostles. So next we have Philip. <clears throat> Philip was called by Jesus the day after he met Peter and Andrew. That's again in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 tells a lot of the story of where these guys came from and how they met Jesus. And he simply was called um, the day after. So he, he was there from the beginning. Um, really the only significant, if you want to call it significant, story is in John chapter 14 and verse 8 where he asks Jesus a simple question, show us the Father. John chapter 14. Oh, and by the way, what I love about John, a little lesson I take away, is he was a son of thunder. He was, had a fiery temperament, but you see over his long lifetime, he changed. And he wrote, you know, 1 John, which is all about love is of God. And, and if, we're, if we say we're of God, then we love God and we love everyone else. And, and so I love the change that took place in the life of John. Uh, now, Philip, John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? And Philip is just typical of, of all the apostles. They were eager. They were, you know, pretty devoted and faithful men. But, you know, even they wrestled with the nature of Christ's coming kingdom and, and some of these questions about his deity and and things like that. So Philip is pretty typical of all the apostles. His death is believed to be that he was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Now Bartholomew, again, this is one of those where we kind of piece things together a little bit, but most people believe, and I think this is a pretty fair assumption, that, that Bartholomew is also known as Nathaniel in the scriptures. When you look in the lists of the apostles, Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 6, you always seem to have um, Philip and Bartholomew paired together in the lists. And so it is that in John chapter 1, it is Philip who brings this person named Nathaniel. Well, okay, that, that's a fair assumption then, that, that as Philip is usually paired with it says Philip and Bartholomew. Well, in John chapter 1, we have the story about how Philip came and he brought along with him this guy, Nathaniel. In John chapter 1, verses 47 through 51, uh, Jesus says, Here is a Hebrew in which there is no guile or deceit. He looked at Nathaniel, which is probably Bartholomew, and, and, and instantly knew. Here's a pretty solid guy, a man of excellent character. No deceit in this man. And so that's pretty high praise there in John chapter 1. Uh, his death is said to have been placed in a sack and thrown into the sea. Others suggest he was crucified. And that's a pretty likely outcome for, if you don't know how they died, crucifixion is a pretty likely guess. Uh, we have Thomas. In John chapter 20, we read the story about the doubter, doubting Thomas. And let's turn there really quick. There's a great lesson there for us. You can't really blame Thomas, you know, for, for wanting proof. And let's be honest, we all want that sometimes. We've all been in the place of Thomas where we just kind of, you know, I, I need to see some proof. But the lesson we learn is, no, you don't. We have excellent testimony from eyewitnesses. We ought to be able to take their word. In, in a lot of cases. John chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, which means twin, by the way. So he was probably a, a, had a twin brother somewhere. Uh, he was not with them when Jesus came. This is after Jesus' resurrection. 
But he keeps hearing that Jesus is resurrected. He probably says, you know, you guys, I, I want to see him too, but, but that's not possible. Um, verse 25, the other disciples therefore were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it in my side and be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. So when he was given the evidence, he believed. And that's good. But notice what Jesus says. Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. And that's us. We don't get to see Jesus like this. We don't get to meet Jesus on the road and be blinded by the light like Paul, the apostle, was. But we have excellent eyewitness testimony which should be sufficient, according to Jesus. Thomas is believed to have been thrust through with a spear somewhere in India. We have Matthew, also known as Levi, who was a tax collector, and he threw a great party for Jesus. He, he rejoiced. He welcomed Jesus into his home, and, and so that's a great story there. Matthew chapter 9 tells a little bit about that. So uh, beyond that, that instance in Matthew 9, we don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, except that he was a tax collector and, and uh, also known as Levi. His death is said uh, by some to be a natural death, by others that he died in Ethiopia being slain with a halberd, which is a pike fitted with an axe head. So that, he either that's pretty divergent paths for his death, either natural causes or a pretty violent death. But again, we see a guy who when he meets Jesus, he is eager, he rejoices. Great lesson for us. When we meet Jesus, when he's in our life, we rejoice. We're happy for that, and we share it with others. James, the son of Alphaeus. Now, there's a story in, in Matthew 15, verse 40, leading into chapter 16, that talks about uh, the women who witnessed Jesus' death and were trying to prepare his body for burial and were there to discover the empty tomb. And one of those women is said to have a son named Tom, or uh, said to have a son named James the Lesser, which means younger or smaller. Could have been short or could have been a young man, but it could be the same one that uh, his mother was named Mary. But I don't know, that tells us a whole lot about him. So other than in the lists of apostles, he's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. So James the son of Alphaeus, possibly that, that brief reference to James the Less or James the Lesser um, as the son of Mary who who was there at the empty tomb. But beyond that, um, we just know he was one of the apostles. Now, um, people suggest he was stoned by the Jews for preaching Christ. But again, we can't substantiate that 100%. Now we have Thaddeus. Um, I like this little blip in John chapter 14. He is probably also Judas, the brother of James. Again, this is when you kind of compare the lists of apostles in all of the Gospels. And in Acts chapter 1, you've got these comprehensive lists. And so you see what the one name there that, that, that seems to be, you know, discrepancy is probably just one man that has two names. Thaddeus was probably Judas, the brother of James. But I like what it says in John chapter 14 and verse 22. John chapter 14, verse 22. Now, if I were named... Uh, Judas and I was one of the apostles, I would probably go by my other name, wouldn't you? In John chapter 14 and verse 22, um, it says, Judas, parentheses, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened to you that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not the world? That's when Jesus said he's going away. But I like that John has to point out, Judas, not Iscariot, not the bad one. You know, Judas did so much damage to that name that nobody else wanted it. That's, that's what I suspect is going on here, why he's probably the Thaddeus mentioned in other lists. Yet in Luke 6 and Acts chapter 1, it says Thaddeus, or sorry, yeah, it says Thaddeus, not Judas. But the other lists of apostles, like Matthew 10, for example, it mentions Judas, brother of James, or, or for example. So, um, Again, we don't know a whole lot about him, but uh, his death is unknown. I couldn't find anything about what people say traditionally about his death. Um, and Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were a very radical group of, of 
nationalist uh, Israelites, so to speak, who hated Roman rule. Uh, their weapon of choice was the, the dagger that they could keep inside their cloaks, and they would often go through crowds and go behind Roman soldiers and stab them in the side and sneak away in the crowd. And so they were pretty violent. And, you know, you might say extremist or terrorist, you know, might really be a, a, an okay description of who the zealots were. They hated, they abhorred the fact that they were controlled by the Roman Empire. One thing I want to point out here, though, uh, at the top of the right-hand column, you've got Matthew the tax collector, and you've got Simon the zealot. You've got a super conservative Republican and ultra-liberal Democrat. They got along, as far as we know. In Christ, you can rise above your differences in political ideologies and pursue something greater. That's what I love about these two men is, you know... <laughs> From the eyes of Simon the Zealot, Matthew the tax collector was a sellout. He was the one taking money from his own countrymen and bringing it to the bad guys in Rome. Yet Jesus taught a new commandment to them that you love one another. And that was what defined these 12 men. Um, <clears throat> so before we finish the lesson, let me just address the elephant in the room, and that is Judas Iscariot. Um... I didn't include him on the list, but I, I am going to talk about Matthias next. I, I kind of want to do them a two for one. But we know that Judas, in Matthew chapter 26, he betrayed Jesus for a price of money. And other scriptures mention casually that he uh, pilfered money from the money box. I think that's something they, they probably didn't see happening. But afterwards, they kind of connected the dots and realized, okay, that's probably why the numbers didn't add up, and, and that's probably why he wanted to be in charge of the money box. And so Judas was, was chosen to be an apostle. Um, some debate whether he was chosen for a reason. He fulfilled a number of uh, prophecies about being, Jesus being betrayed by a close friend for 30 pieces of silver, and, and that friend would then commit suicide in the potter's field. And so a lot of prophecies were fulfilled regarding Judas, but at the end of the day, he took his own life because of the grief of, of what he had done. Um, <clears throat> he was replaced by Matthias. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, just, just for a moment here. Acts chapter 1, we, regarding this idea of an ongoing succession of apostles, the scriptures don't tell us how to appoint an apostle. First of all, they had to be witnesses, and nobody's a witness of Christ today. I'm sorry, having some ghostly vision or apparition of Christ in your mind is not the same thing as sitting down and having a meal with the resurrected Christ. It's not the same thing. That doesn't make you a witness just because you claim that. So first of all, nobody's a witness of Christ today, so we can't have apostles. But secondly, the Bible doesn't tell us the process for this. They didn't choose Judas' successor. In Acts chapter 1, you'll see that Peter is the one who stands up and starts connecting the dots. And, you know, in verse 20 of Acts chapter 1, it, you know, uh, he'll be desolate and in his office let another man take. And, and so verse 21, it is therefore necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. So again, that's a, that's a pretty limiting qualification. So you have these two men who are put forward, uh, Joseph, called Barsabbas, uh, and Matthias. But they can't decide between them. So they prayed, and um, they cast lots, and they said, Lord, the decision is in your hands. The Lord chose Matthias. They just narrowed it down to two people who had been witnesses of Christ, but they didn't choose. It doesn't tell us how we're supposed to choose or select a new apostle. Um, so I, there's really no indication in the scripture whatsoever that we're supposed to um, replace an apostle, every apostle, as they die. And beyond that, when we get to Acts chapter 12 and James the apostle is beheaded, there's no mention of we need a replacement for James now. I think these 12 men, Matthias, not Judas, represent, in my mind, the 12 names written on those 12 foundation stones mentioned in Revelation 21, and they represent the foundation upon which the church was built. Um, and, and so that's it. We had 12, and, and that's, that's it. But there was one more who was untimely born. 
We know Saul of Tarsus. In Acts chapter 9, he was on the road to Damascus to go and persecute Christians. And Jesus appeared to him. He saw a blinding light. And uh, he said, Saul, why are you resisting me? I've got a purpose for you. I've chosen you to be my, my special messenger, my special apostle. And so when people ask me, how could Paul be an apostle when he makes 13? And I said, you know, if Jesus says, I want one additional apostle who's special and different, Jesus can do that. That's always been my thought on the matter. Paul wasn't one of the 12, but I believe Paul is, was recognized as equally authoritative with the 12. But he wasn't one of the 12 apostles, but he certainly was chosen. 1 Corinthians 15 is the last scripture I want to read for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. By the way, I, I skipped this. Simon the Zealot uh, suffered martyrdom under Trajan. Some think crucified, possibly even in Britain. Uh, Matthias is said to have been stoned and then beheaded. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 15. One final bit of evidence pointing to the fact that we don't have apostles today. Regarding Paul himself, he talks about how Jesus appeared to um, Cephas and then to the 12 apostles and uh, and then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, and most of whom are, were still alive when Paul wrote this letter. And uh, chapter uh, 15 and verse 7, he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8, and last of all, meaning Jesus didn't appear to anybody after this, last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Think about what that means. Paul said, I was untimely born as an apostle. It means that the time for apostles was over. That when Paul came along and was converted, the time for apostles, they had already been chosen years before. Paul is a little blip on the radar. He says, I was, I was born out of time at the wrong time, but I was chosen specifically by Jesus for this task. As one untimely born, last of all, here's me. So Paul represents the end of this. Um, <clears throat> his death... Uh, writing around 110 AD, Ignatius noted that Paul had been martyred, perhaps beheaded during the reign of Nero. All but likely John suffered a violent death, and we owe a, a great deal of gratitude to these men, uh, even the ones we don't know a whole lot about. They did incredible things. They are the foundation upon which the the church that Jesus built, the foundation upon which it's built, the teachings that they revealed and, and gave to us, and we ought to treasure them in the Bible today and be thankful for the examples they left us uh, and, and be ready to tell the world about what they mean to us. They represent the foundation, they taught us, and their words are scripture. We don't need apostles today. We don't need more than any foundation than just the one. So I hope that's been helpful. I know a little more information than, than anything else, but... Uh, you know, we might get asked about apostles from time to time, and I think it's good to have some answers ready. Uh, we haven't really been teaching how to become a Christian, but uh, certainly want to offer an invitation that if uh, you'd like to hear more about the gospel, you'd like to obey the gospel call to be baptized in the name of Christ, you need prayers or encouragement, we invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing.